The Blackfoot River Wildlife Management Area is the place where several smaller streams converge to become a river. It's easy to look at the Blackfoot River landscape and wonder what, if anything, could be wrong with this beautiful place. Trends in fish and wildlife populations, however, signal problems. Fish and moose are two examples on opposite ends of the spectrum. Native fish populations have dropped to a fraction of historic levels. Moose and other wildlife numbers have also declined. Taken separately, these trends can point in so many different directions. The Blackfoot River project did start out, and in some ways, it still is, a lot of individual projects, each addressing different problems identified in large part by fish and wildlife trends. We knew fish were very susceptible to predators, but how exactly do you fix that? Targeting predators did produce good short-term results, but the results don't last without repeated active management. A long-term solution needs to identify why it was so easy for predators to get to those fish. Many of the problems in the Blackfoot River are the result of riparian vegetation removal approximately 100 years ago. The missing vegetation has allowed increased erosion for the past century. Now mentioning an eroded river often produces visions of deep incisions. In the case of the Blackfoot River, however, erosion was widening, not deepening the river channel. The wider river became shallow and full of sediment and lacked deep pools and escape cover for the fish. In the heat of the summer, this wider channel allows water levels to drop below the reach of riparian plants. In other words, the river has become disconnected from its floodplain. For wildlife like moose, the riparian habitat they utilize is almost gone. And thinking about moose, we know another preferred moose habitat, aspen forests, have declined. Conifer were replacing aspen through the natural process of succession, the result in part from a century of fire suppression. As these projects developed and biologists with different backgrounds worked together, everything actually became more and more connected. Now it's hard to imagine one project without the others. Wildlife biologists initiated a project to remove conifer to stimulate the aspen stands. Prescribed fire was a preferred method, but we didn't have the resources to make sure we could keep a controlled burn controlled with the amount of fuel buildup on the landscape. We were already moving forward with plans to log and use the revenue from logging to clean up trees that weren't marketable. We were also developing a river restoration plan and determined the river needed trees, lots of trees. In fact, the very conifer we wanted to remove to promote aspen were a perfect fit. Other river projects may pay $500 or more for a tree like this and they will have to cut it into pieces because it doesn't fit on a truck. Now we were concerned at first about digging up thousands of trees, roots and all. We envisioned craters that would need restoration work of their own. Fortunately, the result's the opposite. Traditional logging leaves behind a stump graveyard, which can block aspen seedlings. Root wad removal clears the way for faster aspen recovery. Some of the smaller conifer are cut and scattered to prevent erosion and maintain nutrients. As the trees make their way to the river, they cross broad meadows that were more connected to the river floodplain in the past. This drive across the meadow may become impassable after these trees help raise the water table and restore historic wetlands. So now you see these trees becoming transformed from a mechanism of aspen decline to an instrument of restoration across the entire landscape. The River Project is a great place to see process-based restoration in action. In the river, these trees will become much more than just a place for fish to hide from predators. Water flowing around the tree will change. Energy will be redirected. Some structures are fairly simple and easy to see. This tree uses the root wads as an anchor with the treetop out into the river. It'll push water away from the banks where erosion takes fine topsoil and muddies the stream. Slack water behind trees like this will actually give sediment an opportunity to settle, cleaning the water and reversing erosion. 
After less than one year, this tree is already beginning to create new land. Other trees are placed with a top buried as the anchor and the root wad working into the stream. Most of the tree is buried deep into the bank to make sure it can't wash away. The result is energy directed in many directions, especially downward, to dig and maintain a nice deep pool. Now, instead of eroding topsoil, it will stir up and clean the river gravels, creating better conditions for fish eggs and invertebrates to grow. Structures can become very complex. Most structures include multiple trees, but they're really just a combination of these basic building blocks. An eroded bank may be stabilized with dozens of trees all connected together. This structure armors the bank but you can see at the edge of the root wads, a deep pool has formed. A few very complex structures combine rock and trees to ensure floodplain connectivity, in addition to all the processes mentioned from smaller structures. Real transformation occurs when it all works together. Working together, these structures reduce the size of the channel. During spring runoff, they will send floodwaters onto the land. Now floods in the wrong place, like at your house, are not recommended. But flooding in the right place is a different story. In a healthy floodplain, water outside the banks can slow down, reducing the destructive energy. Water will also soak in to be stored in the upper basin and gradually make its way back to the river later in the summer. And in the process, sediment falls out and restores nutrients and topsoil. And the ultimate goal of process-based restoration is to hand the project over to nature. Some structures will become hosts to beaver lodges. For the past decades, any attempts by beavers to colonize this area have been washed out. They will now have a solid anchor to hold their construction. Beavers will use the restored riparian vegetation, like willows, to maintain the system with lodges and dams as the tree structures fade away. To make sure beavers have the resources they need, we are planting thousands of willows, aspen, and cottonwoods in the areas where the newly restored water table will support them once again. This project is just a snapshot of a large network of conservation in the upper Blackfoot River system. I can't overemphasize how fortunate we are to have neighbors all around us committed to restoration and landscape conservation. Neighboring ranchers have been working hard to improve grazing management and conduct their own conservation projects. They're also working with us on grazing exchanges to protect spawning areas, reduce sediment, and restore their own lands. Mining companies and nonprofit groups have joined forces to create an initiative to improve the ecosystem. You can find more stories like this at upperblackfootconfluence.org. Volunteers are looking for every opportunity to help us out. Conservation on a large scale only works when people come together. And I'm so lucky to be a part of this effort. <laughs>